Hello everyone, welcome to The Weeb Initiative, I'm your host, The Weeb. This is the show where every other week I'll be talking about anime, manga and everything in between. This week, I'm going to talk about following our last four episodes, the fifth season of Symphon Gear, also known as Zenki Zensho Symphon Gear XV. This is a really, really important, I mean, it's the last season so basically it's the most important one because it's the finale of the show it's a um, journey we have had uh, for I don't know like eight plus years at this point and to me at the very least this is a really good although a bit a bit messy and sometimes not well explained a really really good season they pull all the stops the music is spot on the animation is great all round and it's just just a fever dream it's just a fever dream in the best way it's really cathartic really completing i don't really know how to say it in english but it's so resolving it's so good and again this the music is awesome they, this last season they really did their best with songs with all the characters and all I'll, I'll get to that eventually, but <laughs> first off, let's start with the stats. The studio is the same for the five seasons, so Satellite. It was originally aired through July 2019 to September 2019. It has the uh, normal 13 episodes. The last episode is special because also between the 12th and the 13th episode, if I had to wait a week, oh boy, <laughs> questionable acts would ensue. But anyways, that's beyond me already. We three years after this, and I need to get going. This may become the two-hour review, a two-hour review, but we'll get to that. So a quick uh, disclaimer, um, spoiler alert: I have a whole lot of things to explain. There is some, some plot twists and things that I will reveal and I need to explain because some of the more intricate details are really not explained and are more uh, inferred rather than explained. But anyways, the whole thing is going to be explained either or because the, um, the action goes from beginning to end in this season there's no stopping they try to cram so much plot and so many explanations in 13 episodes i wish they had the luxury of 25 episodes but given everything 13 episodes kind of does the job it's really beautiful even though it's kind of cramped if you follow the whole anime to this point you see the mastery and the craft that came up with the fifth season although it's crammed and you can clearly see some plot holes or some t some parts that are not well developed at the very least in my opinion i'll explain that a bit later but easy to say it's a good season though it's clearly not perfect it's really easy to pick apart uh, so before i start with story and the plot just a bit of a backstory i didn't know this was the last season when i first watched it so back in 2019 i had to like it took me seven or eight episodes to finally get the idea that this was the last season of symphony year and I, looking back, I see like, yeah, if you don't actually pay attention, it kind of seems like a normal season, kind of. Although there is this one thing that happens on episode 7 that, easy to say, it's the turning point. I mean, turning point on the 7th episode, it's more or less a lie, the turning point 
happens way earlier, but this is the seventh episode is special to me. Let's get to it. So I will not explain all the episodes, I think, because they do not get uh, they do not show all the details and they do not actually explain the whole thing because some parts are more let's say locked up in in of themselves and some episodes are just they just are explained with one two phrases maybe because the episode is more way more uh, visual towards the fighting and the songs rather than the plot itself and I prefer to just explain the plot because I cannot explain visual things in a podcast form not in a way I am comfortable with but anyways so let's start enough jibber jabber already so episode one uh, after undefined amount of months later after the end of season four we see that the guys at Song have gathered some intel that shows that there is something happening in the South Pole. So the girls are naturally sent to the South Pole to investigate. Going there, they found this moving giant kind of robot thing that they said it's a coffin uh, from the custodians, the precursor civilization that we had on Earth. It's hinted that in the fourth season, I kind of uh, said this in the fourth season review, but the custodians are really more explored in this season because the story goes uh, full circle and we go back again to deactivating the curse of Balao because the moon and something else. We'll get to that, but easy to say the girls have to fight this giant moving coffin that f- fires this kind of attacks that they say it's the impossible physics that's the it's magic more or less because it's beyond the comprehension of humans or something like that it's really akin to the powers that they hinted at in the fourth season when they said the power of the gods and tiki becoming the final fantasy boss at the end and hibiki also becoming the fourth uh, huge angry boss at the end of the fourth season but anyways so, first explanation I need to give here is that there is this thing they do in the beginning of the this season, the first time we see a transformation and with the first time we see the new weapon they acquire from the fourth season to the fifth season is the what they call the amalgam. And so it's the, the combination between the Symphon Gear and the Philosopher's Stone. Now, how did this happen? So, just a little explanation, really brief. In the last fight of the fourth season against Adam, Hibiki has to finish him while the other girls kind of lend their gears to her. So, for a really brief stand of time, Hibiki has all powers of the six Symphon gears. And it's really, really brief. And you could say it's not really explained, but in having the six gears kind of attached to her, she also grabs one of the, the Philosopher's Stone of Saint Germain, and then this basically fuses everything, and then Hibiki activates the Golden Gangnir at the end of Season 4. That being said, that, that kind of translates to the fact that every one of the girls has kind of fused with this Philosopher's Stone. So all of them have kind of acquired an amalgam because Hibiki used their powers back in the fourth season. It's never explained and you have to really pay attention to this this detail. But anyways, that that being explained, all the girls have amalgams and eventually we'll see uh, their manifestation. The amalgams really have different forms to each one and that's basically it. so first episode they have to fight this giant thing and eventually they defeat it because Hibiki activates the amalg- her amalgam that is this two let's say hoken arms coming off their, her back that a giant golden gauntlets more or less 
Okay, so past that, they open up this coffin and then comes a tall mummy with this bracelet kind of thing that they deem is a relic of the custodians. Okay, that being said, episode 2, we have this first show off of the main villains of this season and the important thing about this episode, right? Tsubasa and Maria are having a live concert and in the midst of it, it is attacked by Oka noise, so you can really see the PTSD hitting already. Tsubasa has some real hard PTSD already because it's the same of the, se of the first season. She was just performing live and then noise. So it comes first this part, so the PTSD starts there. Then we go to the fact that the main antagonist of the season appear. He has one of the most hardcore scenes I can say I can say hardcore really because man some and this is stuff to remember sometimes but this anime really goes hard in some violent parts so it has one of the most violent parts I can remember from this series even worse than the first season and the second season that have some really hardcore parts and basically in the midst of it one of the girls that is the one of the main main antagonists of the season, she uses a, a some kind of curse in Tsubasa that it's a fusion between a curse, mind control, hypnosis. I don't. It's some kind of that, and she kind of becomes locked in the in her own fear, so she's afraid. Oh, and she starts to act really, really, really like a coward most of the time. Most of the time. All the time. For the foreseeable future. And this is the second se the second episode of the season already. And so she's going to be afflicted with this for a whole last time. That being said, this is the first part where I have to interject. This season, the one part I really don't like is first. The fact that Tsubasa can't catch a fucking break. Tsubasa suffers so much in this season, it, it is pitiful. I mean, I, I, bec I have become watching it really, like, not worried, but I just wanted to help her because at some points, this season can't give her a break. I will get to that, but she cannot find resolution in herself, even at the end. It's really, really sad. And... I have to say also, they stop doing the Maria Tsubasa ship, which is a really, really bad thing in my books, because the Maria Tsubasa ship was the best one. I mean, Miku Hibiki is just so obvious that there's no, there's no denying it, but Maria Tsubasa was kind of cute. Anyways, I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked already. Let's get to it. So this is episode 2, so they have this whole attack, they kill a whole lot of people and Tsubasa is afflicted now with this curse kind of thing. Okay, episode 3, getting really short, we have the presentation of the main villains officially, so it's they are called Nubble Red, they are remains of the Bavarian Illuminati. We later learn their kind of backstory, it's a really bad backstory, it's one of the worst I think it's the worst group for our antagonists in this show because they have so much things coming up that they really become like second plans because there's so much things that happen with uh, antagonists in this season that the three of them, that is Vanessa, Milarki and El Elsa, they are just so badly developed. It doesn't even feel like and Siphon Gear antagonists. And that's basically it, but I'll get to that. So episode 3 is basically their presentation more or less. Fourth episode, we have the real, the real breaking point, the real revelation, the first plot twist. Again, spoiler alert. So there is this one, I have to explain it like that. 
there is this one line, I think it is in the fourth season, that Tsubasa's grandfather, aka Kazanari Fudo, he kind of inter they he kind of thinks about what if we had the power of the gods to air quotes protect the nation air quotes here and as it is he kind of he kind of did it the madman kind of found some way to get someone to give him the power of the gods so the whole context is the following these guys in noble red the vanessa elsa and milarki the antagonist girls they have they have this need to first consume this kind of rare blood they kind of give the name but i couldn't find it in the web so whatever and also he kind of finances their equipment to activate the the bracelet that they stole from song so i kind of skipped a bit here but the bracelet we found in the first episode is stolen and nobody knows who but actually uh, fudo has stolen it and given it to noble red because he wants to activate it and gather the power of the gods that's basically the whole sh the whole thing Given that, we now know that Fudo is actually the one that is financing them and helping them fight and also we later learn now in episode 5 that Fudo being one of the higher higher ups in the government and one of the guys that uh, helped pass some kind of legislation back in the fourth season because of the impending disaster that was the cocoon that Hibiki transformed into and the fact that there's there was a kind of a literal god in Japan and nuclear stuff and you get it the guy is the big cheese in the government we kind of learn in episode 5 that first uh, there is this whole kind of inspection slash audit inside song because apparently someone could get a bureaucrat to sign something that blocked them from uh, continuing missions because Hibiki activated the amalgam and the amalgam was not a known weapon or something like that and for one reason or another they have the power to stop their operations let alone be possible but whatever they stop the whole thing all the girls are more or less blocked from using their powers, more or less. That, that's the best thing I can, I can think of. But the thing is, right, so at this point, Tsubasa is acting like a coward. All the girls can see that she's not normal. And so F9 and Hibiki take her and Miko, because uh, let's go out together, to uh, karaoke. And... Everything's going well because it's going well and all. But at some point, Miku and Hibiki has, have some kind of misunderstanding. And then, noise attack near there. Later, we kind of discover in the between the fights and everything that the inspection was actually kind of fraudulent and was done as a diversion because there is a mole inside song or inside the government. We then learned that actually everybody already knows that Fudo is behind everything. So the higher, higher up. And, and I have to remember, I have to remind everyone, Tsubasa's grandfather is messing up with Song and actually financing what we, we would call terrorists because he wants a hierarchical weapon. What? I mean, in the fourth season review i said that i didn't like him and i don't like him this season just proves me right because he's one dimensional bad guy and you know that from the get-go because he is the end-all be-all antagonist of everything the anime has said thus far the one phrase that he mutters every every time is that songs cannot save the world when actually we have four seasons that prove so so, I mean, it's not r really hard to pick him apart, but at the same time, he just gets in my nerves. I, I don't know, I hate him. Anyways, back to the story. 
episode 5 we have this whole Alkanoise attack near near that and then there's this kind of I will not say it's a jump scare but it is a really if you again spoiler alert if you're not if you are not paying attention the the end of episode 5 is really shocking because it's it would seem like Milarki has kidnapped Elfine and killed Miku but then uh, in episode 6 we actually find out that actually of 9 and Miku were kidnapped by Naborat. We also learned that uh, Naborat at this point is operating in the ruins of the Chateau de Trifages, that is the, the third season uh, word dissector, word destroyer, because Kazanari Fudo had the power to just give the whole ruins to them. And apparently, it is still kind of functional, more or less. So, after that, we have also in episode 6, we have the kind of activation of the bracelet for the first time. And then comes out a huge... I cannot explain what that is. It's kind of a cocoon made of light with tentacles coming out of it. And somewhat it resembles a spider. I cannot say why. Anyways, that, that's the, the episode 6. So, finally, the power of the gods comes out. And we already de dealt with it, so we need Hibki to basically punch it to death. But then we have to enter a whole nother chain of explanations. So, first off, at this point, right? So, episode 6, episode 7, we have... F9 and Miku locked into the the chateau, and the girls are the rest of the girls are kind of scrambled. Hibiki is more or less out of combat at this point because she's in house house arrest because she used the amalgam, but for no apparent reason they kind of do that. I don't know how war works, but <laughs> I'm sure it wouldn't be wise to lock up your secret weapon. Anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. So, first line of uh, explanations. So, one, one thing that we had in the fourth season is that Hibiki can absorb the divine power of the relics and whatever, the power of the gods. The thing is, the only, the only people that can absorb the power of gods are people that are clear from the original sim, basically have their pure soul, aka can ride the flying cloud but that's a, no a whole other anime the thing is way back when in the f second season <laughs> and this is an important detail later way back when in the second season when we had the, the fight when Miku was kind of kidnapped into the um, into fees and Dr. Ver got the uh, that mind control device into her and she had she got the uh, the Shishojin, I think it's the name, gear to fight Hibiki and actually activate the frontier. Way back that point, at that point, and Hibiki was burning up because she was fusing with the original Gangnir. The thing is, right, when Hibiki grabbed Miku and threw, threw them both inside the, the Shishojin ray, the kind of ready to, to activate the frontier that gear had the um, property to clean clean out impurities and that kind of thing the thing is both of them being hit by that being made both of them clear in the soul and claims them of the original sim so basically them both became vessels to the divine power and so, as with Hibiki being able to be to be the vessel of divine power, Miku also can be the vessel of divine power. And that's why they actually kidnapped her and Elf-9, because Elf-9 has still a power inside the parts of the chateau that are functional, because her body is the body of cattle. And she is also kind of an alchemist, 
and so she can kind of control the whole thing. So also, this is a quick aside, right? Milarki has this one power that, as with Tsubasa at this point, that Tsubasa has this kind of a curse and mind control thing. The mind control doesn't actually come up yet, but it come up comes up when we we see their inter her interaction with Elf Nine because she has this kind of hypnotic thing that she just kind of gives the evil eye and Elf Nine kind of activates something not being actually conscious of herself doing it. So it's kind of hypnosis mind control. And so she uses Elf Nine to activate a kind of a generator that had um, they had inside the the chateau because it was there no reason given but they use it to funnel power into the bracelet to then awaken the huge cocoon that we saw in episode 6 episode 7 is basically an um, explanation of what the heck happened in episode 6 and then we get the part where I don't have sympathy for Noble Red whatsoever so Noble Red until this point we I think we already have their kind of backstory at this point. They were... At first, there's Vanessa. Vanessa is the main main girl in the Red, although Milarki has the most, let's say, plot-moving powers. Vanessa is the most important one because she's kind of the leader of the group. But anyways, Vanessa was a Bavarian Illuminati that was kind of a researcher for relics and so on and so forth. At some point in her her life, one of the experiments she was conducing blew up on her and so she lost from the neck down in her body. That being said, the, the Illuminati at that time basically built a whole body for her made out of relics. But that being said, she became kind of cyborg. Her, her powers basically are based on the fact that she's a cyborg so moving uh, I don't have a really good explanation for that be except missiles coming out of the boobs anyways <laughs> oh boy. that being said right what do we have at this point is that we have this really really short flashback between from her, their past is that uh, after Vanessa became a cyborg, she became kind of a impure being in the Illuminati, so they basically bumped her down from researcher to test subject to test the effects of whatever into a person fused with relics as body. So it's kind of messed up, it's really messed up. They And they kind of show that Milarki and Elsa were also test subjects by their own right. Milaki has this whole power about morphing one part of her body at this point. For, anyways, she has this power to morph parts of her body to attack and do stuff. And also the evil eye thing. And Elsa has this really... I don't know how to explain it. She has a connector in her, her back. Uh, I would say her, she has a connector in her back and she has this kind of attachment that she carries into a pocket dimension travel bag that connects to, to this connector and so she can kind of use a tail more or less. it becomes a tail and she has wolf ears that's basically it. that's the best explanation we'll get out of me I, I cannot explain they do, do not explain anything really it does not become relevant until like episode 9 anyways anyways so episode 7 coming right back to the story right so i explained all these kind of things the double red backstory and why i don't have the sympathy for them at this point in time i mean like i already had already used the evil eye at elf 9 miku is basically unconscious at another room and so what do they do they use the <laughs> and this is the uh, running theme with the antagonists in this season they try to cut loose ends and so she you kind of uses the magum to try to destroy elf 9s mind 
And this is the part where I was really mad at Noble Red because I, I really thought like, man, this is the worst antagonist ever. And also they they really just are beyond saving, right? So I was like really mad. But then when she tries to use the Magan again, who else do you hear other than, oh my god, Karo is still inside Elf Knight. So, so for some unexplained reason, when Milarki tries to use the evil eye to destroy Elf Knight's mind, then try to really dig deep to, I don't know, I don't know how this kind of thing work, but she basically, when she tried to look deep into Elf Knight's soul, Karo come out and come out like just one phrase, right? And this was like, oh my God, what's happening? Is she, is she really real? Is this real? What? And then, basically, right? At this point, Elf Knight kind of wakes up from the evil eye hypnosis mind control kind of thing. Some spare bodies of the auto scholars from season 3 come out to save Elf Knight for no apparent reason. Uh, no apparent reason, right? So they can see, they can kind of sense that uh, Elf Knight being in Karo's body is in danger, so... And then we we see the, the auto scholars again, and we see them in a good light, because they, tr they are trying to save Elf Nine because she is and is not Karo. And, and this is so awesome. And so there's this whole kind of, ch uh, kind of chase, chase slash fight scene, because the auto scholars kind of get the jumping on to the Noble Red and they kind of run around and contact Song to say yo I'm alive and I'm inside the chateau again for no apparent reason and so the the whole thing come, comes crumbling down as the um, they talk to Song and they send the girls into there but they they have to do something and, and rescue Miku and Off Night. Oh boy. And at this point, the whole things, the whole thing starts to go wild. So then we get this kind of chase slash fight scene with the uh, the spare parts. So the the auto scholars in this case, right, the, the spare bodies of the auto scholars, they are fractured in some parts. You can see there they have defects, but they work as the original auto scholars, although they have more limited. Uh, capabilities we can infer that rather than see it because they do not spend that many frames into of animation into them but anyways the idea is that uh, th those are incomplete or defective auto scholars that are still kind of working because elf 9 activate the chateau more or less and and then we see the auto scholars one by one being kind of defeated by the Noble Red because they have this, they get a new sh kind of shipment of the, the special blood they need, so they kind of, it's more or less, they get kind of cleansed, it's more like um, hemodialysis rather than kind of straight up drinking blood to get powers. But anyways, besides the point. From that point on, when the last auto card of is defeated when Gadi uh, really does uh, get down Mr. President into F9 when all hopes lost and we think F9 is is dead for good what does happen the best song in the season starts to play and the, and god damn it's 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 beautiful man it's beautiful it's it's awesome it's such not a cathartic but such a good feeling that the song is my favorite the side note it is my favorite song of the whole season and the whole series is is for Sandro Zankyo that is the team song for Kero in the fifth season when Kero is actually revived because she she saw that Elf 9 was going to die she comes out as the main kind of personality in the body. We see Durdabla 
coming out again from thin air and then she this song is awesome and then she appears man Ikaru is back and we got and she's the good one of the good guys now god damn it's awesome it's oh boy this the seventh episode is so good and and she and this is the part where i <laughs> i got the idea of oh boy this is the last season of the show because i mean there's this kind of thing right when we talk about media in general it's really hard to kill a protagonist to kill an antagonist is a call that the author does most of the time but the one thing that you kind of never do if ever is kill the side characters and elf 9 being one of the most important side characters at this point if not the most important one when she says when kararu comes back and starts showing up with the whole lot of power and everything else when Elf 9 says that she will burn the memories of Carol and herself to fuel the powers of Carol and the Durdaba, that's when I thought like, oh, this is the last season. They are going to kill everyone to end the whole kind of thing. And to be fair, to an alert, only Carol dies, kinda. But the thing is, at this point in time, episode 7, Kararu comes back from the grave. Boy oh boy, we are into it. This is the last, the last stretch. Because also, I'll just say this. From episode 8 forward, it is just fighting with little bits of break in between. Just to uh, give off some, some, kind of, some kind of plot. That's basically it. From episode 8 forward, the fight does, doesn't stop until the last, the second part of episode 13. And that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's beautiful because it's songs all around. It's, oh boy, it's so good. Anyways, can you tell I have listened to the songs of this season back to back for the last two days? Uh, more or less, uh, I'm exaggerating. Anyways, so episode 8, we have the real fight with Kararu against the Naborette and the fact that the girls fly down to the chateau to kind of destroy the the huge cocoon more or less but the thing is right so Kararu comes out gives the the instructions to actually finding a god because at this point for whatever reason right Kararu has it is also inferred, but Kararu has actually seen the fact that her being just a personality stuck inside of Nine's body and, and being able to see her growth and her relations with the other girls and all, again, knowing that she's just a personality at this point, she decides to help humanity because at this point she kind of already got her resolution in the third season after Elf9 had that kind of conversation with her about the fact that the um, challenge her father left for her was to understand the world in a constructive way let's say after this so Kararu is ca helping actually she has no qualms with the past, with the fact that they more or less defeated her. But anyways, the point is, Akaru actually gives the instructions to beating the god's powers for good. And that is the symphony, the harmony of the se seven musical scales. So I can't, I can't say for it because I don't understand music at all but at this point the seven girls together singing can actually reach a point of harmony that beats the gods barriers and powers that's the gist of it that being said we got then Hibiki coming out after her 
house arrest and all the seven girls are there together and singing because Karu apparently has more phonic gain than seven million people for no apparent reason because and and then they start to kind of beat the the crap out of the cocoon and and then then the things happen where first things right they beat the cocoon open more or less what comes out of the cocoon Miku with the Shishojin armor gear fossil over the symphon gear she had in the second season more or less it's a kind of reconstruction they never really explained that but it's kind of a reconstruction kind of deal following that they they were going to win at this point but at the last second oh my god how i hate that how i hate that old man the guy just goes into the um, into the Tsubasa radio says the magic word she just activates the mind control she whips out hibiki and the girls grabs miku nearly defeated and just flies off into the distance Ooh. oh boy how i hate that old man and, and at this point he's the ma the main villain right now because also at this point noble red was basically defeated outright by Kataru alone so two episodes this is episode eight the episode eight ends with this shit show i will not sure they call it it's a shit show episode nine episode nine we have the try to try to bring Tsubasa back because everybody knows that Tsubasa is not actually doing it because she wouldn't do it something so idiotic as wipe the, the girls out just to grab and kidnap Miku again so they basically send Maria, Maria Tsubasa's father, and the director of song. It's again, uh, you get it, uh, Tsubasa's uncle, the the redhead guy. The three of them and Ogawa, because Ogawa is the main servant, butler, ninja, contracted assassin, a whole lot of things. Whatever. They send the four of them and a whole lot of agents from whatever to apprehend Kazanari Fudo at his home because they have all the evidence that he was involved into financing Noble Red and doing a whole lot of other stuff. Thing is, right, they it goes as well as you would expect. They actually use Alkanois to uh, Kazanari Fudo actually uses Alkanois not directly but Alkanois show up at this point, it shows up, kills all the extras, the agents. They find Tsubasa. Maya has to kind of beat Tsubasa more or less. We see the Amalgam of Maria just to uh, clear out Tsubasa. And eventually they talk it out. It's not something... I wish, I wish that the mind control kind of thing was broken when Maria just hit this lap at Tsubasa, but it was not like that, I think it, there is the, not the poetic win lost, but um, there is some kind of cliche that we could have gone and gained extra anime points at this point, but uh, nevertheless, eventually Maria talks it out and Tsubasa kind of breaks the, the mind control thing on her, to the point that Kazanari Fudo actually tries to use it against, but Tsubasa basically just is having none of it. And after there is this whole fight scene between Tsubasa and Maria and, er, and everything else. At some point, Kazanari Fudo comes out, tries to use the mind control. At this point, Tsubasa is kind of free of it, so it doesn't work because Tsubasa is kind of having a mind break at this point because she, she kind of remembers the fact that she did some bad stuff in the last 24 hours the guy just and again her grandfather comes out pulls out this c96 mauser points at her press the trigger and he shoots her father just comes out does a get down mr president on tsubasa saves her but dies she has a secondary mind break because her father 
died in front of her, defending herself, and defending her from her grandfather. Oh boy, it's so fucked up. So Basta can't catch a break, man. Can't catch a break. And so she activates the Sinfo Gear again, gets her amalgam activated. There is this whole kind of flaming, blue flames kind of sword. It's, it's kind of beautiful. Attempts to kill her grandfather, but then her uncle stops her because family doesn't kill family and she has a ter a tertiary mind break and it, oh boy and she can't get resolution at this point because again let's just release really quickly she did she basically she basically helped her mad ass grandfather kidnap a minor lock her up use a kind of mind control device on her and give her god powers for with without consent to a tertiary use that she has no control over she beat her friends kidnapped the girl to help her grandfather again nearly nearly killed her best friend that is maria got her father killed and cannot kill the perpetrator i mean what the f oh boy she can't get a break, it's beautiful. I really, I'm serious when I say that. I'm, I'm really dramatic, but I'm really serious. I really just wanted to give her a hug, right? Because at this point, there is no resolution anymore. What are, what are you going to do, man? There's no forgiveness in here. There's no, there's no, no nothing. Because she, the amount of suffering is so much. It's really pitiful. Uh, and I mean it, I really mean it. At this point, somebody just give her a hug already. And it doesn't happen. I, I, uh, it's incomplete, I, I would say. There is the, the other thing, but... Anyways. At this point, we have the secondary plot of the episode. In between this whole kerfuffle that, that is happening, between the fight with Maria, and nearly kill you, killing Kazanari Fudo and... Again, stopping Tsubasa be before she can actually kill her own grandfather. Noble Red kind of sneaks into the compound, finds the secret base there is that Miku is being kept at, kind of reverts the mind control they had on her, and I kid you not, the first thing that happens after they kind of mess up with the controls of the mind control device that Miku has, the three of them, the three of the Noble Red, the head, they sneaked in, messed up because they have to have vengeance on Fudo because he discarded them after they were defeated, they die. <laughs> uh, the, the thing that is inside Miku's body, that, that is Shinha, I, I had to... Now that I think about it, I it would have been better if I said the name of the not on the bracelet, but the, the entity that is inside Miku. It's called Shinha. She, the first thing that she does after he gets control over Miku's body, because the mind control is not effective anymore, she laser the three of the Noble Red down, and then we pass to the episode 10. Episode 10 is more or less just a huge, 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 huge mess. The thing is, right? At this point, we know what Shinha is. We have this whole, whole flashback. It's kind of a flashback of the prehistoric events. So the, the fact that when the Curse of Balao was activated, really. And just quick, quick explanation of the flashback. Because there's this point where they show some some things and the connection is not really easily done if you're not paying attention but let's go so there is this flashback i think it's episode 10 i don't actually remember when in the episode it is but there is this this flashback that is there are two people fighting it is shinha in her original body and enki the custodian hero that did the curse of Balao. Now, hero, I'll, I'll tell what happens because there's this whole explanation that 
to later to explain where she ha comes Shinha comes from. But anyways, so there is Shinha and Enki uh, fighting. At some point in the fight, Shinha uses this kind of special attack she has. That is the silver silver ray kind of thing. I don't remember the the name they give it, but it is a kind of a ray that transforms everything it touches into silver. But it's kind of it has some kind of activation period. Let's say it takes a time, but it will transform anything it hits in silver in a matter of seconds. The thing it is at this point Shinha is the bad guy and Enki is the good guy we learn how after the fact but I'll get to that so Shinha hits Enki with this silver ray kind of deal in the arm Enki in a desperate desperate attempt at life cuts off his own arm to impede the proliferation of the silver transformation the them both uh, Shinha and Enki then trade uh, stabs, Shinha kinda dies, and Enki has this really last stand kind of deal. He goes to undefined place, he, and detail, right? His arm that transforms into silver falls to the ground. I'll, I'll get to why that's important in a minute. So he goes in his last stand, almost dying kind of deal, activates the Curse of Valor. Now, why did I? Uh, mentioned the fact that his arm falls to the ground. The fact is, at some point in, I think, episode 6 or something, Vanessa mentions that Alterga, Altergam, uh, uh, also known as Sinfon Gear that Maria has, is an unknown relic kind of deal, and they show the image of the original relic, and it is Enki's arm transforming into silver. That comes up in episode 10 and 11. Because, a quick story short, the girls from Noble Red actually revive, they become monsters, and they now serve Shinha in Miku's body because it is. And also, they alienate themselves from being human altogether because the power that Shinha uses on them to kill them and revive them at the same time, has fused themselves with their power, so they are actually uh, not human slash monster kind of deal, they are just monsters now, so for instance they, they cannot uh, become human again as they wished with the power of the gods. A anyways, the, the I'm getting sidetracked, long story short, they are tasked with messing up with the lunar ruins, the actual, they have to go to the moon to finally disable the curse of Balao. That being said, see the people at Song at this point already sussed out the fact that they need to go to the moon to find whatever they need to, f to defeat Shinha, because Shinha at this point, and quick pause to the explanation again. <laughs> Can you tell there is a whole lot of plot in this last season? God damn it, so much. Quick thing. So we saw it in the flashback that Enki killed Shinha in her original body. But the thing is that when they reach the moon ruins, the only people that can traverse the... the let's say it's a temple, more or less. The only people that can kind of traverse it without problem is Maria because... Her Symphon Gear is seen by the security system as part of Enki, but they never explain it. It's really just a mysterious kind of thing, but you can kind of infer it all because they show it all, but it's never really explained. But again, I'm here to explain all this deta this kind of details. At this point, it's been more than one hour of recording, I don't care. Anyways, so... There is this projection of Enki that, that is the uh, security program that runs in, in the um, ruins of the, the... They say it's an observatory kind of deal. So they explain more or less the whole backstory. So for whatever reason, the custodians have set up this 
planet laboratory that is Earth. And so they created life and me messed up with evolution to test whatever they were doing. And Shinha was kind of a, the main scientist of this kind of deal. And in the eyes of the custodians, Shinha was trying to gather power by creating and messing up with the planet in her own way. In a way that was not the directive, more or less. Enki is never really explained what he actually was. He was kind of a guardian, but we never really get the explanation of what he was guarding. If it was just the planet, if it was the directives from the main custodians kind of deal, or whatever. But Enki was there to stop Shinha, more or less. A quick side note inside the explanation. Fine was the lover of Enki and... Well, go back to the to the first season, we, we saw that Fine was actually trying to save Enki because she thought the Curse of Balao was not something he, he did. I don't think they actually explained that in the first season, but anyways, that, that's beside the point. The thing is, we get the explanation that Shinha tried to, to mess up with the life on Earth for her own purposes, and so they tried to stop her. But the thing is, why Shinha is back inside Miku's body, they actually explained that by some kind of power she had, she translated herself into code inside the genetic code that all things have in Earth. So, for one reason or another, there is a piece of... a really, really tiny piece of Shinha in every human and everything in the, on Earth. And so she's, uh, as they say, de facto immortal because she cannot die as she's implanted inside the very core of the human biology kind of deal. And so, and she, she, Shinha, after some time, has also explains that she only revived and she can only, uh, she could only be activated from the bracelet because in the second season when Maria unites all of humanity in one will to stop the frontier the lunar uh, the lunar disaster that we had in the second season uh, in that one moment she had kind of had this jump start kind of deal and revived more or less reactivated so uh, back to the <laughs> back to the thing, right? Episode ten, episode eleven. Uh, so there is Noble Red and Symphon Gears inside the Moon Ruins, and meanwhile Shinha is inside Miku's body, trying to recompose herself with the power of the internet because we have code and everything else. Because she kind of uh, became not only part of the. Um, biology of people but also she's part of the language so there is parts of every language that's her kind of thing that's why the communicate the curse of balao disrupt communication and disrupts the single single language we had the understanding between the different beings in the planet to impede the her power to unite herself again and revive more or less that's a terrible explanation to a really complex kind of deal but the curse of Palau is basically a nullifier to the fact that Shinha can uh, restructure herself in the single language that she translated herself in it's really better if you watch the anime watch the anime it's really good anyways so at this point episode 10 episode 11 so Symphon Gear Noble Red at this point to go to the moon, there is this whole thing where they try to, the people at Song try to protect a rocket that was going to the moon in the first place. Be in between the fight, Elsa tries to one man up against Kirika and Shirabe. And Kirika and Shirabe at this point are so Yuri Bait together, they are so, so in union that they can de facto just wipe anyone out, then both activate their amalgams and 
using unison and uh, everything we had uh, going back to all the seasons they mess up with the powers of Elsa so Elsa basically cannot use any more of her attachments basically nullifies her as a combatant she cannot do anything anymore in the combat front uh, in between this and that Maria and Tsubasa now Tsubasa is after they go to the moon right uh, Tsubasa is really apologetic and uh, after all this and, and they have this whole circle around Tsubasa kind of accepting the fact that there is forgiveness for her because she knows the weight of the things that they she did but she sees that everyone is willing to forgive her for her mistakes although it was not hers but that's besides the point again the thing is right so at this point Tsubasa and Maria are together in the moon Milaki tries to one up against both of them she uh, begins to activate some really obscure powers that she got after being revived as a full monster and as all comes up both Tsubasa and Maria activate their amalgams respectively and mess up with Milarki also in a similar way that Elsa's messed up already so Milarki has this this one power that seems kind of a like like Bayonetta's um, bets out I don't remember the name of the move but at some point Milarki divides herself into a bunch of little bats but Tsubasa uses uh, Tsubasa and Maria uses use a kind of a flamethrower more or less and destroy 99% of the bats so I mean, like it's now de facto really little really small and basically lost all combat capability also and then we get to Chris and Hibiki that fight Vanessa in a kind of similar way too but in the fact that Chris kind of almost defeats Vanessa for good Hibiki faints the last punch let's say and try to ride the roads to forgiveness with them so they can de-alienate her their own humanity themselves so de-alienate is not a word um, they can recover her their notion of humanity again so they can uh, repent for their mistakes also and the fact that they really did some bad stuff I still don't have I don't sympathize with them they are not worth it nah. at this point we are at episode 11 and they are really just nah man nah they did too much they did too much and so at this point Vanessa is also kind of really destroyed in her body she has like I think one functional arm but then after they give up on messing up the curse of Balao as Shinha was instruct them to do, Shinha kind of uses her powers to control the uh, Vanessa's body because she basically reconstructed their body so she has full control over them when she needs it. So Shinha uses Vanessa's body to mess up with the curse of Balao. Hibiki tries to, it's a really heartfelt moment, tries to kill Vanessa in a way because she asked for because she want, don't didn't want to do any more bad than she already had but they kind of fail and she has kind of reconstructed more or less but not really anyways it all comes down to this with the help of noble red in their final stretch of energy and power they construct our, our path to the girls to return home now that the uh, Shinha's plan is really going out all out and this is only episode 11 remember we have two episodes the last episode really action-packed uh, so the plan of Shinha now episode 12 to 13 the plan of Shinha is that she will erect this kind of structure net structure more or less they call the Idrazil, Idrazil. I, I don't actually know how to pronounce that. Idrazil, the Norse tree of life, 
it is some kind of net con structure that would reinstate the single language between all humans through the um, all systems they have we have so internet and, and kind of deal because uh, as the curse of Balao was and was not disrupted the single language in fact was not reinstated so the lunar the lunar ruins were still working kinda so the curse of Bala was not lifted because Hibiki did interfere with the, the kind of deal that Shinha tried to use but then Shinha uses tries to use the the internet really to recompose herself because she can do that they never explain this kind of deal and basically all the all humanity comes together to try to stop it and while that's happening the Sifogiro are, are coming back to earth and they activate X-Drive and it's a new style of X-Drive and then we go full force head first into action so the first assault basically we see Kararu coming out trying to 1v1 Shinha head first doesn't work then the girls appear we have all the seven harmonies and uh, the seven scales coming together so they can actually break her barriers her powers and all we get this <laughs> it's kind of corny but the song for this part is called perfect perfect symphony it's a really good song for, again the songs for this season are so good Chris's song this season is awesome but that's besides the point the thing is perfect symphony they get fighting they start to get kind of advantage more or less but in the last second uh, Hibiki hesitates because she could not punch Miku in the face <laughs> I mean at this point what can you do she's fighting the main waifu who would, who could have done it nobody anyways so after they the end they get wiped out with the x drive and, and so on and so forth then we get and at this point right episode 12 everything's full going so after hibiki hesitated uh, she ha kind of sweeps everybody off the floor she uses that silver ray kind of deal full force then Kateru comes out of nowhere uses her all her powers every last memory she has to use a uh, gold trans transmutation to combat the silver the um, silver ray kind of deal and she wins I mean it's a bit she kind of destroys one part win one little part of Miku's uh, armor at this point but anyways so Kateru spends her last resources with that with that happening for some reason the, there is this whole the earth kind of eclipses the moon so for one second there the um, the curse of Balao is lifted and in that one second Shinha got the curse of Balao off so she got the biological curse uh, the biological connection back so everybody is basically de facto stunned more or less it's, per it's a perma stun and so sh she basically won at this point we, we see everything and oh boy we lost but there is this one person in the in the planet that got cleansed from all these kind of things and has this extreme determination to save everyone and it's Hibiki and Hibiki with her the less of her powers because at this point also Shinha has used most of her resources to fight Kararu because the last the last conflict not conflict the last clash they had was really brutal Hibiki uses her god killer powers punches Shinha and extreme extinguishes her I cannot say words anymore extinguishes her from existence for good she kind of yeah kind of punches Miku extinguishes 
everything from of Shinha from the earth because she was kind of complete for that one moment. But then she being complete, she's destructible and all. And so Shinha is no more. Although there is, and then we go to the second part of now episode 13 actually, because oh boy, how f things work like that, right? Episode 12 is actually episode 12 and 13. Then we go to the second part that basically is the fact that the it's a drill, it draws you kind of um, net structure kind of deal that is going to transform the planet and do some kind of uh, return to return to monkey kind of deal to the planet is still working although Shinha is dead and so the last thing that Kataru passes on 129 before she extinguishes herself from life because she burned every last memory she had and not elf nine's memories the fact is she kind of leaves the ex the explanation and, and the instructions to defeat the defeat the idrazu a net structure kind of deal so the girls at this point are all like spent everyone every last one of them so the six girls are spent they cannot uh, for the love of them defeat any more enemies and they have to go to the down sh the sh down the shaft of this huge tunnel that is the Idrazil that is in front of in front of them because it's the main shaft and the core is basically there and basically at this point obviously enemies come out and we are like oh boy what do they do the six of them are in really bad shape they cannot fight who comes to the rescue if not Miku now bolstering the Shinshojin gear? Who would I guess? She basically clears the, these kind of small fry enemies. The seventh of them, now that Kataru is not here anymore and Elf 9 cannot use the double. The seventh of them gather up into this Idrazu core, sing the worst named song one of the most cathartic resolving resolution i don't i don't know the right word for this one of the most touching the the flashback song one of the best songs in the season called extreme vibes oh boy how do how i hate that name it's not a good name for for that moment i i cannot i cannot make justice uh, explaining here but this the moment is so beautiful and the name of the song is so bad and it goes for two minutes and 30 that is, that is super short and the song is awesome the song is awesome the the moment's awesome the both the animation and the song together it's one of the best composures like I, anyone could have done there because it it is the uh, f final song of the of the series at this point we get to see Everyone that went, everyone that went, where everyone that helped, at this point, we get to see Serena, we get to see Mum and uh, Natasha, uh, Mum, we get to see San Germain, Cagliostro, Prelati. I I think I'm pronouncing her name wrong. We get to see Naburaid, although I don't like them. Anyways, we get to see Canada again. We get to see uh, Tsubasa's father. We get to see everyone. It's really really beautiful. But then again, <laughs> this is a, neat, a really, really small nitpick, but it's just just a, a thing I, I felt like sharing. The naming is terrible, the song is awesome, whatever. So that being said, the whole thing explodes, the whole thing starts to explode. The girls kind of almost don't make it, but there is this giant, I don't actually know what is. It's kind of a sand spirit, more or less, in the form of Shinha. Uh, grabs the girls. There is this one really little exchange akin to when Fine died in the first season. That is basically Miku and Hibiki kind of redeeming Shinha as a person at the last second. It's kind of like that. I don't think it 
works as a redeeming thing, but they do it anyways. And long story short, that's the end of the series. Actually, Hibiki and Miku, they don't actually officially stay together, but it is inferred at this point that it is love and so they will keep together forever and ever. And that's the end of Symphon Gear, more or less. <laughs> I don't think I did a great job at explaining everything. Most of it is really confusing. I tried to explain the nitty gritty details of the things that happen because there are things that don't actually come out in the first time we're watching. And basically, again, now for my opinion, right? So I already wasted one one hour and, and a half just on explaining the whole season. <laughs> Let's go to my opinion. So I don't actually know how to even to start this this part, and, and I don't actually want to drag it out too much. But anyways, so first things first. This season is good, but they they actually use some some tricks that I don't actually like. So I explained everything, I tried to explain it at the very least, everything in a direct manner. So, uh, how? In the order of things that happen. In actuality, the anime shows a whole, whole lot, and multiple times they use a whole, whole lot of flashbacks, either to cut up the details so they don't have to actually use the, let's say, the frontal kind of presentation, they don't actually have to use transformation animations for some fights. They don't actually need to introduce some... At some points, they don't actually need to introduce the enemies. Uh, some parts can be cut off of episodes because the last episode already showed the details. So they use a really uh, small flashback to kind of show a small change for when we saw the direct kind of feel. This mostly happens uh, between episode f episode five and six, when Miku and Elf Nine are kidnapped. So they they have this uh, this scare at the end of episode five that they use a little detail in the same scene just to explain that the scare was was really just a scare. It was n never really anything to be worried about basically it's a fake death more or less the they cram a whole lot of deep lore into this season although they although i try to explain most of it maybe some parts i may have lost it at this point i already said what Fine was i think i already said Fine from the first season was originally the bride of Enki so when Enki died Fine lost uh, her loved one and so that basically started the whole cycle of her reviving people to then try to break the curse of Balao but it's never explained uh, how she expected to return Enki once the curse was lifted that's one plot plot hole that I couldn't find a response to. Another thing, again, and now this, this is the review for the whole series, right? As I said previously in the fourth season review, the fourth season is really more uh, added, uh, circumstantial more than additive. So as we saw, as we can see in the fifth season, uh, the influence of the fourth season is really marginal did not work as a season, I would say, at the very least, much in a way to add to the plot. It did not add so much, neither in the plot point, nor in the sentimental kind of deal, because really the only part where we see we have this connection with the Bavarian Illuminati from the fourth season is at the end when we have the destruction of the Idrazil and we see all the, let's say, the ghosts of the past. And this is just a uh, uh, nitpick on my part, but anyways, I have to say it. The, again, uh, 
for the fifth season, they use a whole lot of tricks to kind of pad it out in parts that I don't think they needed and try to give context to things that don't actually matter at the end. As I already said, the, explana uh, the explanations and the backstory of the um, Double Red are really lacking in many parts. There is no connection point. There is no sympathy or of them. For them, I it's really reminiscent for, of my note of my notes of in the fourth season with the Bavarian Illuminati originally that they are not well explained and uh, it comes out as a secondary kind of deal when we see the first, second, and third third seasons. We see a develop, uh, well-developed and well-presented antagonist. For the second season, is the first season already is hard to say because Chris eventually comes up and becomes really one of the main girls. But at the same time, we get to see a whole development and backstory of Fine. In the second season, the Maria, Kirika, and Shirabe become Sinfon Gears for a fact. But we get to see both a development and kind of growth of Dr. Vera and Natasha. And we even kind of get to see the relation between Maria and Serena, kind of. And the third season, I, I can't say that the third season did the same job. Because I think the third season was the de facto best season in this aspect. We got, if not... As much, we got more time with the antagonist than the, the protagonist, actually. We saw Karo, we saw the autoscotters, we saw so much. Although Karo was really more of a close character and most of the explanations came afterward, more or less, Karo was so much more developed than the antagonist for the fourth and fifth seasons. Again, even the fourth season kind of got somewhat of a development, although I really wanted uh, Pelachi and Cagliostro to have some real development. They didn't, did not have this kind of luxury, let's say. But overall, again, the fifth season is the best season by all metrics I could think of. Animation, songs, the whole presentation, the composure is awesome. The fight scenes, and the songs used in them are just so well well made, well performed. I to say that I like the artists that went into this project more and more because of the the way that they are presented in the fifth season is not an understatement, but eh, it's something. As I said, also the best the best song by far by far in this season is for San Luzanquio that is Mina Seinori, Karo, theme song in this season, it is by far the best song and it's one of the worst songs to research through YouTube and normal means because I don't know what happened really and I'm talking about in the West. I can't find the songs in Spotify or YouTube. YouTube is a DMCA bot shit show for the songs of Symphon Gear for one reason or another, I don't understand it. There is this box set with all the songs of all the seasons. One day I'll buy it, I swear. Because I I feel like it deserves it. If I could, I would buy a figure of Kararu. Because she's she kind of became my favorite girl for one reason or another. And I don't... Now that I think about it, I don't think I said it before, but after Miku kind of transforms, uh, transforms when in the the between of the fight in in episode eleven, episode twelve, I mean, uh, when Miku transforms in the Shishojin uh, gear, she has a, a single um, her theme song, right? And also when she transforms to help the, the girls at the end of episode 13, she has her theme song. It's also a really good song. Just wanted to put it out there. 
not better than for some reason Q, but really good either way. And man, I, I, I don't really know what I'm saying anymore. Basically, this season is awesome. This anime is worth it because of the fifth season. Because following the whole journey to get here and to see the way that they ended is so beautiful. As I said before, this season is so cathartic. When Extreme Vibe is playing and we see all the ghosts of the past, it is releasing, it is relief, it is so nice to see it all, to remember it all. It's it's nice, it's just nice. And that's basically it. I cannot drag it more than already have. But last scores 10 out of 10 10 out of 10 on all fronts except the antagonist the antagonist i don't i don't like it also quick side note i did not talk about it i think uh so after the the fight between tsubasa almost killing her her grandfather almost killing kazanari fudo they lock him up in a special kind of prison because as with Gen having superhuman strength that we see in the first seasons, Kazanari Fudo also has superhuman strength and some kind of weird powers, whatever. Point is, he gets locked up. I wish Tsubasa could have had a revenge, but so is the world, so is the, the anime we watch. Anyways, that's basically the review for the whole series of Senki, Sensho, Sinful Gear from the first one to XV all 50... 65 episodes, right? Anyways, um, that's basically it. If you like the things I do, if you like the show, if you like my rants, my reviews, uh, please like, please follow, subscribe, depending on the platform you are. Please join the Discord. And that's basically it. Um, so share if you can. And I will see you in the next one. I hope you stick around. Bye.